100 million. That's not a typo. One vehicle has sold over 100 million units, not a car, not a truck, a 50cc motorcycle that most Americans have never even heard of. This is the story of how Honda created the most successful vehicle in human history. Picture this, it's 1958 in post-war Japan. The country is rebuilding from ruins. Most people can't afford cars. Bicycles dominate the streets. Public transportation is overcrowded. And into this chaos, Honda releases a small, strange-looking motorcycle that would go on to outsell every Ferrari, Lamborghini, and Bugatti ever made, combined, times a thousand. The Honda Super Cub wasn't just another motorcycle, it was a revolution disguised as basic transportation. While Harley-Davidson was building chrome-laden cruisers for American rebels and Triumph was crafting cafe racers for British speed demons, Honda was asking a different question entirely. What if we built something for everyone else? To understand the Super Cub's dominance, we need to understand Japan in 1958. The war had ended just 13 years earlier. The average Japanese worker made about 15,000 yen per month, roughly $42 in 1958 dollars. A small car cost around 400,000 yen. Do the math, that's over two years' salary. For millions of Japanese, personal motorized transportation seemed impossible. Honda's founder, Soichiro Honda, saw this differently. He'd already disrupted the market once by clipping small engines onto bicycles in 1946, creating motorized bikes from war surplus. But those were crude, unreliable machines. He wanted something revolutionary, something that would transform not just transportation, but society itself. The challenge was monumental. Create a vehicle that was cheaper than a bicycle to operate, more reliable than anything on the market. So simple that someone who'd never touched a motorcycle could ride it. Powerful enough for daily use, but efficient enough to run on drops of fuel. And here's the kicker, it had to look respectable, not like a motorcycle at all. Enter Takeo Fujisawa, Honda's business partner, and the team of engineers led by Kiyoshi Kawashima. They didn't just design a motorcycle, they reimagined what personal transportation could be. The Super Cub's development took three years and nearly bankrupted Honda. The company invested 1 billion yen, their entire capital and then some, into developing this single model. Engineers built and destroyed hundreds of prototypes. They tested engines until they literally exploded. They rode prototypes until they fell apart, then figured out why, and started over. The breakthrough came from an unlikely source, American washing machines. Honda's engineers studied how Maytag and Whirlpool had made complex machinery simple enough for housewives to operate. They applied the same philosophy to the Super Cub. The result was genius in its simplicity. First, the engine, a 49cc overhead valve, air-cooled, four-stroke single cylinder. Now, 49cc is tiny. Most. Modern lawnmowers have bigger engines. But Honda's engineers achieved something remarkable. Through precision engineering and an overhead valve design unusual for such a small engine, they extracted 4.5 horsepower at 9500 RPM. Let me put that in perspective. Contemporary mopeds with similar displacement were making 2 to 3 horsepower at best. The Super Cub's engine was spinning at nearly 10,000 RPM, race bike territory for the era, but doing it reliably, hour after hour, day after day. The secret was in the metallurgy. Honda developed new aluminum alloys for the cylinder head and precision cast the cylinder to tolerances measured in thousandth of an inch. But here's where it gets interesting. The transmission Honda created the world's first mass-produced semi-automatic clutch for a motorcycle. Think about that. On a normal motorcycle, you need to coordinate the clutch lever with your left hand, the throttle with your right hand, and the gear shifter with your left foot. It's like patting your head while rubbing your stomach while hopping on one leg. The Super Cub eliminated the hand clutch entirely. The system was elegantly simple. A centrifugal clutch engaged automatically when you twisted the throttle. You still shifted gears with your foot, three speeds in the original model, but the clutch handled itself. Anyone who could ride a bicycle could master the Super Cub in minutes. This wasn't just convenient, it was revolutionary. It meant delivery drivers could carry packages with one hand. Housewives in skirts could ride without wrestling with a clutch lever. Office workers could commute without getting their suits dirty. The frame was equally innovative. Honda pioneered the step-through design, creating what they called an underbone frame. Instead of having to swing your leg over a high seat like a traditional motorcycle, you could step through the middle like mounting a scooter. But unlike a scooter with its small wheels and poor handling, the Super Cub used 17-inch wheels, the same size as many full-size motorcycles. This gave it stability at speed and the ability to handle rough roads. The bodywork was pressed steel with a plastic leg shield. Sounds basic? It was brilliant. The leg shield protected riders from road spray and engine heat. The pressed steel was cheap to manufacture, but looked clean and modern. 
Honda even included a fully enclosed chain case. On other motorcycles, chains needed constant adjustment and threw grease everywhere. The Super Cub's chain ran in an oil bath sealed from the elements. It could go 6,000 miles between adjustments. Now, the performance numbers don't sound impressive on paper. Top speed, 43 miles per hour, 0 to 30, about 5 seconds. But here's what those numbers don't tell you. Fuel economy, 200 miles per gallon, let that sink in, 200 miles per gallon. At 1958, fuel prices in Japan, about 50 yen per liter, you could ride for a week on the cost of a bowl of ramen. Maintenance, intervals were equally revolutionary. While British bikes needed valve adjustments every 500 miles and Harleys required constant tinkering, the Super Cub could run 3,000 miles between tune-ups. The air filter was a replaceable paper element, another first, that cost pennies and took seconds to change. The spark plug lasted 6,000 miles. Some owners reported running Super Cubs for 20,000 miles with nothing but oil changes. Honda didn't stop at engineering, they revolutionized manufacturing too. The Suzuka factory, built specifically for Super Cub production, was the most advanced motorcycle plant in the world. Honda implemented statistical quality control learned from American industrial engineer W. Edwards Deming. Every part was measured, every process was documented, defect rates dropped to levels unheard of in motorcycle manufacturing. By 1959, one year after launch, Honda was building 5,000 Super Cubs per month. By 1960, that number hit 16,000. The Suzuka plant was running three shifts 24 hours a day, but Japan alone couldn't absorb this production. Honda needed to go global. The American invasion began in 1959, but not how you'd expect. While Harley-Davidson marketed to rebels and outlaws, Honda launched the most unlikely ad campaign in motorcycle history. You meet the nicest people on a Honda. The ad showed college students, housewives, and businessmen riding Super Cubs. Clean cut, respectable, normal. The campaign was created by Gray Advertising and cost Honda $5 million, an astronomical sum for a motorcycle company. Harley dealers laughed, the press was skeptical. Who would buy a 50cc motorcycle in the land of V8 engines and interstate highways? Everyone, as it turned out. By 1963, Honda was selling 7,000 units per month in America alone. College campuses were overrun with Super Cubs. Pizza delivery guys adopted them en masse. The US Postal Service tested them for mail delivery. Even police departments bought them for parking enforcement. But the real explosion happened in Asia. In Thailand, the Super Cub became so ubiquitous that Honda became the generic word for any motorcycle. Same story in Vietnam, where modified Super Cubs could carry entire families or 400 pounds of cargo. In Indonesia, Super Cub engines powered everything from fishing boats to generators. The numbers are staggering. By 1968, 10 years after introduction, Honda had sold 5 million Super Cubs. By 1974, that number hit 10 million. Production expanded to 15 countries. Local assembly plants opened in Taiwan, Thailand, Vietnam, Peru, Mexico, and Nigeria. Each market got slightly different versions. More power for American highways, smaller fuel tanks for European regulations, heavy-duty suspensions for Southeast Asian roads. The engineering evolved constantly but carefully. The 1960 model got a four-speed transmission. 1963 brought the overhead cam C100 engine with 5.5 horsepower. 1964 introduced the Sports Cub with 8 horsepower from a bored-out 86cc engine. But Honda never changed the fundamental design. The step-through frame, the horizontal engine, the semi-automatic transmission, these remained constant. Reliability stories became legendary. A Thai farmer reported 180,000 kilometers on his 1961 Super Cub with only routine maintenance. A Japanese postal worker logged 300,000 kilometers delivering mail. In Vietnam, mechanics specialized in rebuilding Super Cubs with over half a million kilometers. The engines just wouldn't die. The 1966 introduction of the C50 model marked a significant evolution. Displacement stayed at 49C, but Honda's engineers had learned a lot about combustion chamber design from their Formula One racing program. Yeah, you heard that right. The same company building grocery getter motorcycles was competing in Formula One. The new cylinder head featured a more efficient combustion chamber shape borrowed directly from Honda's RA271 F1 car. Power increased to 4.8 horsepower. But more importantly, fuel economy improved to 215 miles per gallon. The overhead cam version deserves special attention. Moving from overhead valve to overhead cam on a 50cc engine was like putting racing technology in a lawnmower. The cam was driven by a simple chain bathed in oil, virtually indestructible. Valve timing became more precise, power delivery smoothed out, and somehow it was even more reliable than before. Production techniques kept advancing too. 
By 1970, Honda had perfected die casting techniques that allowed them to manufacture crankcases to tolerances of plus or minus 0.02 millimeters. For perspective, that's less than the width of a human hair. This precision meant engines could be assembled without hand-fitting parts, a massive cost savings that Honda passed on to consumers. The 1980s brought electronic ignition, no more points to adjust, no more timing drift, just a solid-state CDI unit that fired perfectly every time. Maintenance intervals stretched to 6,000 miles, some owners went years without touching anything but oil and tires. But here's what really separated the Super Cub from everything else, Honda never stopped making it. While other manufacturers chased trends, Honda kept building Super Cubs. When scooters got popular, Honda kept building Super Cubs. When sport bikes exploded, Honda kept building Super Cubs. When adventure bikes became the rage, Honda kept building Super Cubs. The production numbers tell the story. 1974, 10 million total. 1997, 35 million. 2005, 50 million. 2008, 60 million. Each milestone came faster than the last, by this point a Super Cub was rolling off a production line somewhere in the world every 15 seconds, the 87 millionth unit built in 2014 went to a museum, but Honda wasn't celebrating history, they were planning the future. The 2017 model got fuel injection and LED lighting while maintaining the classic design. The 2018 edition celebrated 60 years of continuous production with a 195c version, making 9.7 horsepower. Luxury, by Super Cub standards, why most easy? while still achieving 150 miles per gallon. October 2017, the 100 millionth Honda Super Cub rolls off the production line at the Kumamoto factory, no other vehicle, not the VW Beetle, not the Model T, not the Toyota Corolla, had ever reached this number. The ceremony was surprisingly modest. Takahiro Hachigo, Honda's CEO, simply said, the Super Cub is a partner to people's lives. Think about the engineering achievement here. Honda created a machine so well designed that it remained fundamentally unchanged for 60 years, so reliable that many of those 100 million are still running today, so efficient that it uses less fuel than most people drink coffee, so simple that it can be fixed with basic tools anywhere on earth. The Super Cub wasn't just successful because it was cheap. The communist bloc built cheap motorcycles that all died. It wasn't just reliable, BMW built reliable motorcycles that cost too much. It wasn't just simple, mopeds were simple but couldn't handle real world use. The Super Cub hit the perfect intersection of price, performance, reliability, and usability. It was exactly what the world needed, delivered exactly when the world needed it. Today you can buy a brand new Super Cub for about 3600 Adjusted for inflation, that's actually cheaper than the 1958 model. It'll still get 150 plus miles per gallon. It'll still run for decades with basic maintenance, it'll still transport you reliably, economically, respectfully. In a world obsessed with horsepower wars and technological complexity, the Super Cub remains defiantly, brilliantly simple. The modern motorcycle industry exists because of the Super Cub. It proved motorcycles weren't just for rebels and racers, it created millions of riders who eventually graduated to bigger bikes, it funded Honda's racing programs that dominated MotoGP. It generated the profits that let Honda develop the CBR, the Goldwing, the Africa Twin. Every Honda motorcycle owes its existence to a humble 50cc commuter. But the real legacy goes deeper. The Super Cub democratized transportation for half the planet. It enabled small businesses from Bangkok to Lima. It connected rural villages to urban markets. It gave mobility to people who never could have afforded cars. In developing nations, the Super Cub wasn't just transportation, it was economic opportunity, social mobility, freedom. The engineering philosophy behind the Super Cub, maximum efficiency, ultimate reliability, perfect simplicity, influenced everything from the Toyota production system to Apple's design methodology. Build something so right the first time that you barely need to change it, make it so reliable that it becomes invisible. Price it so everyone can afford it, then build millions. As we chase electric vehicles and autonomous cars and hyperloops, there's something profound about the Super Cub's success. It reminds us that the best engineering isn't always the most complex. Sometimes it's about solving real problems for real people with elegant simplicity. Sometimes the greatest innovation is making something so good, so right, that it doesn't need to be innovative anymore. 100 million Super Cubs each one representing someone's first job, first date, first taste of freedom. Each one engineered to the same exacting standards, each one a testament to the radical idea that everyone deserves reliable, affordable transportation. That's not just manufacturing success, that's engineering democracy. That's changing the world one small motorcycle at a time. 
What's your Super Cub story? Maybe you've seen them buzzing through the streets of Bangkok or Hanoi. Maybe your dad had one in college. Maybe you're one of the millions whose life was changed by this humble machine. Share your story in the comments. And if you enjoyed this deep dive into the most successful vehicle ever created, make sure to subscribe. Because the stories of engineering genius hiding in plain sight, they're just getting started.